All right, welcome to The Bridge Podcast. Today I'm joined by Mark Evanstein, who's a composer based in Oregon. And uh, technically this is episode 58, but Mark, I'm wondering, should I find another guest before I release this one so you can get a prime number? Oh, uh, yeah, probably. Okay. That would be appropriate given my sort of recent YouTube video, of course. <laughs> That's well, cute. Um, <laughs> welcome to the podcast, Mark. It's good to have you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. It's funny you said that. I um, when I when I turned thirty two, um, I told my wife that it was my uh, my um, my last kind of big round number birthday for the next thirty two years mm -hmm. because I don't know because I'm in base two. I I don't know. <laughs> I'm just 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 I'm just one of those people apparently. So. I'm sure that the year ahead of that was a really Mersane year. Oh, okay. Oh my goodness. Okay. You're going toe to toe here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, I'm no good with a, with a actual math, but I do enjoy a good prime number. But anyway, um, you know, I usually start these uh, conversations off asking about coffee. And so I'd love to hear about um, if you drink coffee, what your coffee habits are like, what your coffee preferences are like. Yeah. So I think it, so I knew you were going to ask this question. And it's kind of interesting because um, I've gone back and forth with coffee over time. Right now I'm drinking tea um, because, uh, I don't know, a few months ago I decided to just, well, actually a few months ago I was like always really, really tired in the afternoon. And so I thought, uh, I, I started to wonder whether maybe coffee was giving me this kind of dip in energy in the afternoon. And then there was this, this one time when, um, when I was like, uh, I had such bad sleep and I wanted to take a nap in the, in the morning. And I, so I didn't have coffee in the morning because I wanted to take a nap, but then I never took the nap. And then I made it through the whole day without coffee. And then I was like, I wonder if I should just keep doing this. And so I kept doing it and I kind of quit taking, I quit having caffeinated coffee. And it made a difference actually. It, it, with my energy level. I mean, I think it's totally different for every different person, right? Coffee mm. affects people in like very individual ways, but but for me, I'm kind of off caffeinated coffee for the most part. But what's cool about being off it for the most part is that when you have a caffeinated coffee, it's like pretty intense. <laughs> like you really get the energy from it. So Definitely. I don't know. I feel like, I feel like I'm enjoying it. Enjoying are you, it uh, when I have it. What type of tea are you drinking then? It's an Earl, Earl Grey. Earl Grey. Okay. Yes, it's Earl Grey. It's this like ridiculously expensive variety of tea from the supermarket that a friend gave me one time and I decided I had to have it. But it's like, I mean, it's actually not expensive when you think about the cost of like buying a coffee at a coffee shop or something mm -hmm. like that. But, you know, <laughs> anything over a $10 box of tea feels ridiculous. Oh, yeah, definitely. Anyway, I'm sure this is very interesting to your listeners. So, <laughs> well, I mean, we have to, you know, sort of get the personality test uh, results in before we really proceed. So, you know, now, now yeah, people know enough. exactly who you are. Um, cool. Well, um, so you know, I was telling you a little bit about um, my background as like an algorithmic composer, and um, you know, basically how you do similar stuff, just um, a lot more effectively, it seems. But um, I sort of wanted to start with a provocation, which is is all composition not algorithmic composition? Yeah, it's, it's, um, that's an interesting question. So all composition in, it involves rules of some sort, but I think it's a question of whether the rules are explicit or implicit, right? Okay. So, so like, um, you, you know, I think that, if if someone is composing, um, I don't know, let, let's just take Bach because everyone takes Bach as an example, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of um, the way that Bach wrote was through kind of implicitly internalized patterns, right? I mean, maybe he learned some explicit rules at some point in the process, right? Probably he learned some explicit rules of counterpoint, but the truth is so much of it was just practice and practice and practice and practice. Um, Whereas I think algorithmic composition is about like stating all of those rules explicitly, which mm -hmm. when you try to do that becomes really interesting. Um, so like, for example, um, so I mean, probably we'll talk about this at some point, but you know, I wrote this, this big set of Python libraries called Scamp for computer assisted music, right? And 
one of the things that I've built SCAMP to do is generate music notation, right? Um, it, it turns out that when you start trying to generate music notation, you run into a whole bunch of things that you know how to do implicitly, but that you don't know how to encode explicitly. Mm. So for instance, let's say that you have a 4-4 four, four bar, right? And uh, starting on the second beat, you have a note that lasts one and a half beats. How do you notate that note? I mean, I guess um, maybe the correct answer for some is to say a quarter note tied to an eighth note so that you like split up the bar a certain way. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so maybe, so oftentimes you'd want to do quarter note tied to an eighth note because you want to show beat three, mm -hmm. right? Okay, but what if it's a, it's a, a two beats long? Starting on the second beat, but it's two beats long. How do you notate that? A half note? Yeah, why? I mean, that that's interesting because I'm not really <laughs> bothered by not showing the third beat. And um, I, I've been sort right, of so like, there's personal preference too. Right, yeah. <laughs> right, right. So so there's some sort of interesting combination of like um like cultural uh cultural patterns that we've we've sort of patterns we've gotten from culture of like, oh, you gotta show the third beat, but then there's personal preference. So like you do a dotted eight, dotted quarter note maybe on the second beat. Um, I do a I do a quarter note tied to an eighth note, but if it's two beats, then I do do a half note. And so the question is why? Like what is going on there? Why, right? And trying to answer that question and trying to build in um, how to make that work in in Scamp and the kind of notation generating process involved having to come up with. Well, not come up with, I inherited some theories of kind of like beat depth, right? Mm -hmm. Like how off the beat is something, right? And then you've got this whole kind of question of like, uh, uh, like a rhythm tree where you've got, you know, the bar and the, you know, a four, four bar, it's like a bar, which is split into two half notes, which are split into two quarter notes, which are split into two eighth notes. But if it's like a six, eight bar, then you know, it's it's split into two dotted quarter notes, which are then split into three eighth notes, which are split into two sixteenth uh, notes, right? Mm -hmm. um, these this kind of rhythm tree hierarchy and how deep you are in the hierarchy and where the first note starts on the hierarchy and where the note ends on the hierarchy. All of things these things happen to kind of come into play, and you don't know any of these rules explicitly until you try to program it, and right. you're like, oh shit, how do you do that? <laughs> And um, so, I, so I guess that my point is that, that um, when you're dealing with algorithmic composition, you often find yourself in that situation of like, oh, I have some intuition, but how do I explicitly um, encode this intuition in music um, as opposed to just kind of um, doing it intuitively? Um, so, I don't know. I don't know if that's an answer to your question. I mean, it, that definitely does answer it because I think it avoids the question with the actual, you know, important thing, the implicit versus explicit. And I've definitely been sort of like in that situation as well, where you have to come up with a bunch of big picture decisions. And it's like, whoa, this is surprisingly difficult to make everything explicit. Um, like, what's the duration? What's the sort of you know, uh, like duration within that duration? And you have so much to like actually pin down. So the explicit, like, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Um, also, here's another, here's another, pro I'll, I'll respond to your provocation with a provocation. So you asked if all, all composition was algorithmic, right? Mm -hmm. My question is, is all, all composition intuitive? Interesting. Um, hmm. That, I mean, I guess that is a, a pretty good question. Cause when I see your videos, you know, you're like, let's just do this. Let's just do this. And you know, you implement it in Python, um, but still you're like, I feel like what you're doing isn't much different from writing something down by hand on a sheet of paper because you seem to be just like, here's an idea, let me transform it into notation. Um, but you aren't like necessarily being like, I mean, maybe you are at some points, but uh, like, here's this code that is going to have these dynamics that run on indeterminacy. I mean, maybe you do do that as well, but. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the reason I asked that question is, is because, I mean, when you create an algorithmic process, how do you decide what the algorithmic process should be? Mm -hmm. Well, you don't decide it algorithmically, you decide it intuitively, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, so like, 
the process of writing the code has an intuitive component to it, right? Right. And I think it's impossible to get away from this intuitive component in the process of writing music. So, yeah, so I guess I tend to think of this whole question of, uh, well, okay, so, so uh, you know, SCAMP. SCAMP is, so should we explain what SCAMP is? Absolutely, because, yeah. Please. Yeah, so SCAMP is this set of libraries in Python that I started building like five or six years ago in grad school. Um, it's called Suite for Computer Assisted Music in Python. And actually originally that stood for Suite, something like Suite for Composing Algorithmic Music in Python, which is, sounds worse actually, honestly, just, just from an aesthetic point of view. But um, I, when I was kind of presenting it to my, my committee, um, one of the people on the committee said, are you sure it's algorithmic music and not like computer assisted music really? Because the whole point of it seems to be this like dialogue with the computer. And I realized that's, 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 totally, that's totally true. Like the whole ethos of, um, of SCAMP is that uh, the computer and the human being are like co-equal partners in this and they have they each have something to offer that the other cannot do, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that computers just do not have that intuition that human beings have. And even, even kind of all of this like AI neural network stuff, I don't think that's human intuition yet. I think that's still a long way from human intuition. It's some very um, subtle pattern matching maybe. Um, it's kind of amazing what can be done, but, but still it doesn't have that kind of like ability to integrate across a whole bunch of different domains and parameters and ideas, you know? Um, and so, but also the computer can do things that humans can't do very easy. It's very easy to get things like, you know, if I ask you, you talked about primes to like find the first prime number over 10,000, mm -hmm. like good luck, man. <laughs> but the computer can do that. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of music, I mean, the computer can, can do a whole bunch of calculations. It can, I mean, the reason I love working with computers is it can kind of, uh, I can ask a question that I can't answer on my own, but the computer can answer that question very easily, you know? Um, and so, so I tend to think of the process of, we'll say computer assisted music as, um, as this kind of back and forth between a human being and a computer. Um, in which the computer brings out things that in the person that wouldn't otherwise come out, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and I guess the person brings out things in the computer that wouldn't come out either. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. It, with the notational conventions that you were talking about, I'm curious, um, what did pinning those down look like for you? Like. Um, I mean, like, did you make some big picture decisions that you then implemented or was it kind of like, uh, you know, trial and error coming back to it and just being like, I like this, like, I mean, it seems like the preferences are pretty flexible in Scamp, right? Yeah, I mean, ultimately it led to um, making sure that there's a the kind of, there's a bunch of like engraving settings that you can adjust because it did turn out that there were things where I was like, well, I, I don't know, like, what is the, like, I mean, for instance, um, how many dots do you feel comfortable having on a note? You know, like, are you okay with like quadruple dotted notes? Mm -hmm. Like, that's a little much for me. So like at some point I had to say, okay, engraving settings dot max dot allow, max dots allowed equals three. But you know, some people want it to be four and some people are like, I don't want any dots more than one or two, you know? So um, there were, I think actually trying to pin down the notational conventions is what made me realize I needed to have adjustable settings that the user could kind of make their own preferences and also change their preferences from, you know, script to script as well. Um, uh, did that answer? What was your question? I, I can't remember if I answered your question. I'm not sure either, but um, you, you mentioned <laughs> double and triple and quadruple dotted notes. Um, I mean, just to clarify, so like you're saying like a dotted note is add half the value, a double dotted is add three quarters of the value, triple dot right. is add um, whatever it would be. So, I mean, that's seven triple, eighths of the value. Yeah. So it's like 1532 for a triple dotted quarter, right? 1530 seconds of the... Because like a, a double dotted quarter is seven sixteenths, right? 
the double dotted quarter is seven sixteenths. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm following you. I'm following you. Yes. It, this, uh, like I recently uh, <laughs> had to realize it, like I never really had to figure out what a double dotted note meant. Cause like the context would always sort of like explain it. But uh, I, I was looking at a Jason Eckhart piece the other day and I was like, oh, okay, I have to learn what a double dotted note really means. So I realized, oh, it's like 716. But um, so, it, I mean, this is a little bit of a, a geeky digression that I'm curious what you think about. Um, so, I mean, like in many ways, the dotted note is kind of like the inversion of a triplet, right? Because you're fitting two into three instead of three into two. Oh, um, yeah. Hold on a second. Inversion of a triplet. What like it's like um, the undertone of. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To... Okay. So if you're, if you're, if you've got a quarter note, a dotted quarter note is three halves the length and a triplet quarter note is two thirds the length. That's cool. I'd never thought about that. So a double dotted is the same, but for a septuplet, right? Wait, hold up a sec. So that, that would be seven to four. So, well, kind of. It's, it's or, or seven to two. Yeah. I mean, like, I feel like it's, it's like roughly, you know. <laughs> Where are you going with this? I'd love to know where you're going with this. Well, I guess like my my issue is that we're missing an inversion for the quintuplet because we go straight to 1532 for a triple dotted note. And so I'm like, in my mind, it would just be nice to have a way to fill up an entire bar of five something with just adding some like amount of dots, basically. Because, you know, you can fill up a bar of 716 with just a double dotted quarter note. It'd be nice to be able to fill up a bar of 516 like that. But I'm just being, this is just oh, my yeah. answer. I mean, there's, there's always down. been this issue with, with lengths of five. I mean, you know, when we're talking about like issues with notation, don't get me started on things that are like lengths of five. It's very <laughs> awkward that we don't have it. And I, I know people have proposed notations for like, um, for notes of five beats long or some sort. I guess they have a, maybe it was some sort of a dot. Maybe it's like an asterisk or something. Are you talking like about that. like the George Crumb this. thing? I don't know. Is that is that a George Crumb thing? I have somebody I've else come listen, somewhere. Somebody said that if you put a dot on both sides, like front and like in front of and behind a note, then it's supposed to mean five. But I've never seen that myself, and I've never used a notation program that allows that. Yeah. Well, and that gets into the question of no, you know, notation and convention, right? And mm -hmm. there's no point. Well it's difficult to write in notation systems that no one has any experience reading from. <laughs> I won't right. say there's no point in it, but, you know, be careful. <laughs> right. It, well, in any case, I just, I feel like we're missing out because, you know, like if you think about the fifth partial, that's our major third, um, our seventh partial is the, you know, like, uh, you know, the dominant seventh basically. And so why not have that in sort of the undertone reflection of those rhythmically as well? Like, why not be able to do groups of five as nicely as groups of seven? But this is just a digression that- uh, Well, I look, I look forward to <laughs> reading about your revised system of Western music notation. I, I was thinking, you know, you could do two dots as um, five and three dots as seven. So you, know, you could just sort of use some primes there. But um, anyway, uh, I was just curious if you had any takes on that. Um, so uh, in terms of formal stuff, um, you know, I saw something in one of your videos where you're like, I'll basically split the 180 seconds up according to the golden ratio. Um, and I, I guess like, I'm curious how you think about form in the sort of big picture sense. Like, um, mm. like if you have to make the big meta decision of how do you break down, uh, you know, the duration of 10 minutes artfully, how do you think about that problem? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Well, I mean, so, so broadly to start with, right? I mean, I think there's two, actually I was reading, um, you know, you know, the composer Curtis Rhodes, right? Who I studied with at Santa Barbara some, mm. um, he writes about form in terms of kind of like macro form and micro form and he's got meso form as well, right? Um, and uh, and I, he talks a little bit about how, um, you know, there's bottom-up processes to uh, approaches to form and there's top-down processes to approaching form. So like, you know, a bottom-up process would be along the lines of like, 
um, okay, so I'm noodling at the piano and I find some material that's kind of interesting. And then I find some other material that's kind of interesting. And I try combining them. And then I kind of try adding this other thing and try combining them. Actually, I wrote a piece once that was entirely based on this idea in which I just, well, at the piano, just came up with a bunch of like very small gestures, right? And I took those gestures and I tried to find interesting combinations of those gestures. And then I tried to find, it's kind of funny. I'm talking about this as it's like an intuitive process, but I decided to make it kind of like explicit. So here we go. Here's the algorithmic thing, the algorithmic part of my mind trying to make this process explicit. Mm -hmm. But um, then I took those kind of somewhat longer gestures and kind of stuck them together and took somewhat longer and took those and stuck those together. And eventually you start to get to the scale of form, right? Um, I think a lot of people work this way, but in a less... I don't know, uh, prescriptive way where you just start with material and the material gives rise to larger structures. And then over time you start to realize, okay, what am I doing with this whole form? Like, how am I trying to, um, how am I trying to shape the listener's experience over the course of minutes rather than seconds, you know? Mm -hmm. That's a very typical way of working. Another typical way of working um, is and particularly probably since like the 50s, uh, right, is this, is this way in which you uh, are starting with the grand architecture as this kind of, uh, you know, open span of time, which you then segment, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then inside of those segments, you realize, okay, this segment's going to be like this, and I break it up like this. And it's kind of funny, I think, you know, the whole thing about like sonata form, right? Uh, uh, it's, I think that nowadays, if we look at a sonata form, we imagine it as like, okay, here's this kind of box with an exposition, which has this theme and this theme. So I've got to come up with this theme and I come up with this theme and I write the transition from this theme to this theme and I have the development. Okay, so I'm going to cut my theme up and I'm going to do all these little things. That's very much a top down approach to form. I don't actually think the composers who are kind of living in the moment of the sonata form really thought about it that way, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I think that they that that was just in the air and they kind of intuitively followed that method of development and they were a little bit more bottom up than, than that. Um, okay, but yeah, but so you're asking like, how do you approach form? Well, there's the bottom up approach and there's the top down approach. Um, what Curtis talks about, and I kind of agree with him is like this kind of fluidity between the different la layers of scale. like you know, maybe you start with some material and you kind of start to put it together and then you jump up to the top, the top level and you think, hmm, how long is this piece? You know, where am I headed with this piece? Mm -hmm. Then you develop some more material and then you jump up to the top level and then you develop some more material. And sometimes you jump into the middle level and you think, well, what's this, what's the arc of this section? And, and um, I think there's a lot of value to having a kind of fluidity between the different levels of scale. Um, but now what was I going to say? Oh, I, oh yeah. The other thing that I was going to say that I, I learned from Curtis, which I think is really interesting is um, the, the material on the small scale uh, gives rise to different kinds of forms or kind of, I want to say like desires different forms on the larger scale, mm -hmm. right? So not every small scale form, not every small scale structure goes with every larger scale form, right? There's a kind of interplay between the, the two of them, right? Um, and so, you know, ideally your form, your large scale form should be inter like intricately connected with your small scale material and vice versa. Okay, so having said all of this kind of theorizing in my own practice, the way that I approach it, it varies from piece to piece. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's bottom up more and sometimes it's top down more. And I try to be kind of fluid between this, the levels, but I think there are, there are things where you start with a kind of grand idea and the grand kind of a top down approach. And then you find yourself trying to fill out the musical details. And there are cases where you start more with the, the, some sort of material that you think is interesting. And you try to find a form that makes sense for it. And I think I always find that if you start with a top down approach, the question is, how do I make this interesting from moment to moment? Because um, it, it doesn't just happen automatically. Right. <laughs> and if you start with the bottom up approach, the question is, how do I shape this so that the, the listener's experience is meaningful over the larger scale? Because it doesn't just happen automatically. And the one thing that I've learned about algorithmic composition that has held true like every single time is that there aren't any shortcuts, right? 
I, okay, so I, I should say, I said algorithmic composition, but composition, period. There aren't any shortcuts, right? And I, I think I'm maybe starting to, to like get over this now, but for so many years that I always think, ah, oh, you know, if I just came up with the perfect kind of algorithmic process, I just write a few lines of code because the computer can spit out like 10 minutes of music, no problem, right? Mm -hmm. So if I just write the right, if I got the right 40 lines of code um, that just has the kind of the right, I don't know, emergent properties as it plays out, um, then, you know, I just write those lines of code. I've got this 10 minute piece, no problem. I can submit it to the performers or whatever. Mm -hmm. It never works. It just never, ever works. You write the lines of code, maybe there's something of redeeming value to it, but a lot of it sucks. Mm -hmm. A lot of the moment to moment sucks. It's boring for significant stretches of it, you know? Um, because the kind of moment to moment doesn't automatically work just because you have a large scale structure that is, is you know, clear and maybe effective, you know? When you say um, that it sucks, is that just like, is that purely about the sort of lack of, like, is it just that it's boring basically? Yeah, or I like think it, when I say it sucks, I, I mean that it doesn't hold my attention, right? I don't really feel like listening to it. Like, I'm not motivated to stick around for the large scale payoff because the the uh, the more local scale doesn't have uh, have kind of tensions and interest to it, mm -hmm. right? So, like when you're listening to, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously I'm going to just reveal like the fact that I'm a classically trained pianist because all these are all my examples, right? But if you're like listening to like a Schubert sonata or something like that, you care about how this phrase is going to resolve, but you also care about, you know, where you're going in this particular part of the, the form. And, you know, you know, maybe you, you can sense that you're coming back to this kind of recapitulation. And so you're feeling the large scale trajectory at the same time that you're interested in how does this suspension resolve? And how does this phrase resolve? Mm -hmm. All of those things are going on at once. Um, it's kind of the amazing thing about music is this way in which it operates on multiple scales at once, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's very hard to, I mean, maybe impossible, but certainly very hard to compose something that, uh, that, you, that you're kind of, you're composing starting from the large scale and expect for that uh, lower scale, the smaller scale kind of uh, tension to, to be uh, worth paying attention to. I don't know, I'm, I'm getting a little bit uh, muddled with the way I'm phrasing this, but do, do, do you follow what I'm saying? I think so, yeah. Um, when you say sort of like having the, the large form or like the macro form reflect the micro, um, I mean, like, you could have like proportions that sort of reflect one another or like maybe like some sort of like, I mean, I, I guess I'm wondering how, like in what ways can you actually have those uh, different scales of form reflect one another? Um, I, Cause I mean, like if you divide the form into like, you know, A, B, C or whatever, and then you have that same sort of proportion in like the rhythm, in my mind, like I feel that's like that's not just... what I'm talking about actually. Okay. No, no, that, that's kind of like, that's, okay, so we started this conversation with this question of kind of explicit and implicit mm -hmm. and intuitive versus algorithmic. And I actually am talking more in an intuitive way. Gotcha. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think the solution is to have this kind of self-similarity where like, okay. oh, the macro form is in five parts. And so therefore every phrase is in five parts mm -hmm. and I'm using quintuplets. You know, I, I actually usually think that's a recipe for, uninteresting right. music um I agree. because um because and the, actually this is another thing i got from curtis it's um is this attention to the fact that human perception is so so non-linear and so different at different scales right um i mean so obviously one of the cases of this is like y y you know if you have a machine that puts out a pulse uh, just a, it, you know, into the air. I guess you call, I call you call that a speaker. Let's say that you have a speaker. Okay, <laughs> putting out impulses. Um, you know, if it does fifty impulses per second, you hear that as a pitch. If it does ten impulses per second, you you hear that as 
this kind of very fast stream of pulses that you can't quite hear all of them. Mm -hmm. If it does like two impulses per second, it's something that you could kind of clap along to, right? If it does one pulse every two seconds, you can't really clap along to it very easily anymore, mm -hmm. unless you're a musician and you're subconsciously subdividing it. Right. And if it does one pulse every 50 seconds, uh, I mean, you may not even remember that there was a pulse to begin with. Right. Um, I mean, probably you will, but it, it, every one of those scales is different and has its own kind of internal logic to it and, and uh, per, sorry, I should say perceptual logic to it kind of. And, um, and so if you try to just be like five part form, each section has five phrases, quintuplets, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, but they're perceptually, those are completely different and no one will notice the relationship between the two. Uh, so, so, I mean, I think what I, what I mean about the material and the form being interconnected with one another Gosh, I wish I could think of a good example for this. Um, uh, uh, well, here's kind of an example. Uh, I always like to to talk about the the you know the opening of um, of Das Rheingold, Wagner's Das Rheingold, right? Okay like this big E flat major triad, right? It goes on for like five minutes or something. It's like really a long time that it's just an E flat major triad, right? Um, that material immediately makes you realize that you're in a you know three or four hour opera, right? Mm. Um, because of it's like harmonic stasis. Do, do you know what I mean? I think Whereas so. maybe I'm, something I'm that on it, yeah, well, th that's okay. I mean, no one's familiar with anything. There's a billion pieces <laughs> out there, but but the point is that um, the point is that at the the kind of local feeling of harmonic stasis projects a large form mm -hmm. right from okay. the beginning. Those so so the kind of those two things are kind of coupled. I mean, this isn't maybe the best example. Like, let's say that you have an electroacoustic piece which is mostly like just kind of a bunch of uh, uh, sort impulses um in a kind of reverberant space right um how does that evolve over a large time scale compared with just a wall of noise mm -hmm. you know um i don't actually know that there's like a simple answer to this question but mm -hmm. i don't think that you can just apply the same macro form to those completely different textures do you mm -hmm. know what i mean yeah yeah uh, um I don't know. That, that's, that's kind of the best I can do. Mm -hmm. I wish I came prepared with a better example for the thing that I just said about the, the macro form and the micro form being connected, but that's the best I can do for right now. Well, let me run something by you, like sort of in terms of how I, I operate with my current algorithmic death metal project um, and uh, okay. see what you think. So um, basically I've been trying to sort of make form like, I guess, like a little bit indeterminate. And so I'm, I'm doing this all in spreadsheets, basically. And so um, let's say that you have like five random numbers between zero and one. Um, and like, you know, they're just like long strings or long floating points or something like that. You take the sum of them and then you scale each one uh, according to that sum to be, you know, proportional to your final duration. Like, let's say you have okay, 600 yeah, yeah, yeah. seconds. And so, you know, it breaks 600 seconds down basically totally randomly. Um, do you think that there's any sort of inherent aesthetic consideration or like, is there anything about that, um, decision to have it be, I guess, like inharmonic, if you will, formally versus like, if you generate all like, uh, natural numbers between, you know, a given range. So there's at least, you know, the relationship of natural numbers versus just like, you know, uh, you know, random numbers between zero and one that have like 10 decimal places. I, I don't think so. I don't think there's a difference. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I should say it that strongly, but my inclination is to say it doesn't matter that much okay. because at that scale of form, do we notice harmonic relationships? I'm not sure that we do. Mm -hmm. Do we notice like, uh, can we tell the difference over the course? Like if you take a five minute piece, right? And you divide it up in the ratio of like uh, three to two, right? Three parts, you know, 
yeah, the, the first part is uh, three of a certain length. The second part is two of the same length, right? Um, so 60%, 40%. Can we tell the difference between that and like 61%, 39%? No. <laughs> I don't think so, mm -hmm. right? At that scale, we don't have sensitivity to those time durations. That makes right? sense, yeah. Um, but at a shorter time scale, we do, right? I mean, if you talk about like a perfect fifth, right? Um, a, a frequency, this is the same, this is time scale too, right? Mm -hmm. This is just the really short time scale that we start to hear as pitch, right? Totally. Um, so a perfect fifth, so three to two ratio, okay. What about 3.1 to two? I think you hear it. You hear it as not a good perfect fifth, or Definitely. sorry, not a, not a true perfect fifth. You hear the kind of beating in the sound, right? Mm -hmm. So um, this this is that was a really great example um, to kind of to speak to what I was trying to say earlier is that human perception works different at different scales. So whether or not you use simple integer ratios in that way might not matter at the macro scale, but it does matter at the scale of pitch, and it might matter at the scale at a, at a smaller scale where it's perceptual, right? Mm. Um, so. Um, so yeah, I don't, is that, is that actually, so this is actually the way that you're approaching form in this? Sort of, yeah. Like I, I, for a while I was doing this thing where everything was some harmonic of 160 beats per minute. Like I would take, I guess, like a fundamental of say 10 beats per minute and then do upper partials of that. So like, and then it would be scaled according to the meter. So like, you know, 17 at 170 or one, like uh, 19 at 190. So everything is in some ways kind of like 160 beats per minute. And then I would, I mean, I'm just sort of babbling about my my composition process, but um, I, I've moved to this sort of like uh, non-natural number thing just because, and um, I don't know, it's interesting, but it's also like, you know, you have no sort of like, you can't really do metric modulations because there's no actual relationship to anything. Um, if you keep on going with that sort of process. So actually that's an interesting point. So. So maybe it does, maybe it does matter in terms of the way that it affects what you can do at a smaller scale of form. Because mm -hmm. that metric modulation is, I mean, the experience of a metric modulation doesn't really, it's not so much at the, the higher scale form, maybe it's in the kind of meso form mm -hmm. um, that you, you feel this kind of, that you have this ability to kind of shift from, from one meter to another meter at a different tempo or something like that. And mm -hmm. so if you have perfect integer relationships, you can perform these perfect metric modulations, which may matter from the point of view of its performability and how it comes across to the listener. Um, it, it brings it down to that smaller level of form where it's perceptual. So maybe it does matter, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't, it, it kind of, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> okay, so now we're talking about the, the large scale planning having an effect on the on the kind of smaller level of material that you can fit into that grand scheme of grand scheme of things, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. Yeah, and so have you? What have you found? Sort of. It sounds like you are taking a sort of formalist approach to structure sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. How have you uh, experienced that? Like, how has that worked for you? I guess. Um, so I mean, like. A lot of the other aspects are randomized too. So like, it will be like, you know, okay, you have 31.25 seconds or whatever to fill up. And then it'll be like, what's your rhythmic threshold or what's your sort of like, I guess, time threshold? Like, is it 200 milliseconds? How many units can you fit in this time? That means that you're at this tempo. And so it sort of determines stuff. And then from there, the combination of like different meters sort of gives me some sense of like, I guess I could just copy and paste this you know, five part into another five part, and then you have some sort of motivic unit unity, I guess, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it, I think it does make sense. And do you, do you find it to be kind of a fruitful approach when you're composing? I mean, it's nice because it, it takes away so many of the creative decisions that are, uh, you know, like I, because I made some explicit decis decisions like a year ago, I'm able to just keep on clicking a checkbox and getting new forms. And do you like what's resulting? I, I've sculpted it to the point that I think I do like it but um I mean a year ago I did not like it it was uh underwhelming like you know the sort of examples you were talking about um but I, I guess I keep on just rehashing it until it feels right 
but um yeah, yeah. So that's kind of what i'm talking about right there's mm -hmm. no shortcuts right exactly uh, <laughs> but uh but if you keep putting your kind of attention and effort into it then um then over time it can become something interesting um and so yeah so sometimes these kind of algorithmic approaches are almost like a kind of like an open-ended prompt, like what happens if I do this? What world will that take me into? And can I explore that world, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think that's one of the best uses of algorithmic composition because it, it kind of, I mean, one of the reasons that I use computers, um, there's a lot of reasons I, I use computers. I just like programming, so that's one of them. But mm -hmm. one of the reasons that I use it as a composer is because it, um, it, it it makes me write music that I otherwise wouldn't write. And that's interesting. You know, totally. I had this piece called Leaf Loops that I wrote, which was, I took like the, I did this thing called Composing in the Wilderness in Alaska, which was really kind of fun. Um, and at some point I started getting interested in the like shapes of leaves. And then I wrote a little computer program to kind of trace the contour of the leaves. And it's a little bit like, it's a little, maybe it's a little bit, uh, overcomplicated. I don't know how much the leaves really like brought to the piece in the end, but, but I think, no, I think it brought something. The point was the unevenness of the contour of the leaves. Uh, I was using that to kind of shape this kind of looping pitch material, right? Interesting. The result was I ended up with this kind of minimalist music that I started shaping. And I don't normally write minimalist music. It's not really the thing that, well, maybe I do more now because I experienced it through that project, but it's not, that's not kind of the way that I would normally go. If I sit down at the piano with blank sheets of music paper in front of me, I don't write a minimalist piece. Right? right. But because I'd kind of stumbled into this like looping logic of the leaves and I, I made it so it kind of slowly evolved over time, it just, that was the world that I entered into. And I only entered into it because I had this question of what would it sound like if I turned looping leaf contours into music. And I think that's really fun because it brought out a different side of me um, mm -hmm. than, uh, than could have been brought out by just sitting at the piano. So, so I think that, you know, to me, the biggest value to what you're talking about of what, okay, so like, let's take these, these kind of numbers between zero and one, and let's scale the structure of the piece like this, and then we'll fill in the structure. It's like, where did that take you that you wouldn't have otherwise gone, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm sure it took you somewhere where you wouldn't have otherwise gone, right? I mean, totally. probably it ended up with some sections which were kind of a little bit unusually long in duration in a somewhat uncomfortable way to deal with. Mm -hmm. And it's right next to a, dura a section which is like really, really short. And it's like, how do I make this transition from really short to really long? Um, the constraints push you in certain directions. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think you have to do this through algorithmic processes, by the way. Um, I like to, it sounds like you like to, I think <laughs> yeah. it's really fruitful, but I think most composers, um, most composers that I've talked to have some sort of foreign element that they like to kind of throw into their music mm -hmm. to keep them on their toes, you know, Interesting. Um, I, a, 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 a former teacher of mine uh, does a lot of collaborations with different people. Um, and every collaborator brings out a new kind of side of his work because it's it's you know you've got this negotiation between two different approaches to to creating art and as a result like the music is different mm -hmm. and um i think that algorithmic composition is one way of doing it which is really interesting um but i, I guess uh, um a sort of follow-up question to the random number thing um if you saw like an album of music and every single track is the exact same duration. Um, I mean, like, I feel like that's so unlikely that this isn't a situation that you would, you know, usually be in, but like, what would that do for you aesthetically? Like, would you, I mean, what would the thought process be like, oh, this couldn't have actually happened or like, oh, interesting. Everything is like, um, it seems like a sort of unnatural symmetry that I'm intrigued by. And, um, like if it were to happen, it'd be like, what are the chances of like rolling the dice and getting the same number a hundred times in a row, that type of thing. Wait, what are you, are, 
I'm not sure I totally understand the question. Can you can you can you explain one more time? Like sure, yeah. how would uh, I react was... to looking at the album and being like, hmm, four minutes, four minutes, four minutes, four minutes. Well, uh, yeah. So like when I'm doing this thing of like say, you know, pick five random numbers between zero and one, and then you get this very jagged sort of form to you know your macro form. Yeah. Um, you know, let's say that you generate random numbers between one and one. So everything then is the same proportion, but then there's variation within. Like, you know, let's say that each track is exactly 100 seconds long. What does that do to you uh, perceptually as a listener or like uh, sort of on a philosophical level? Because like, it's so implausible to actually happen that way because so many people do the bottom up thing that it wouldn't just happen to be all the same track length. But um, it, it, maybe this is a weird question, but it's just the type of thing. Like that how, I, I how does that, how do you experience that as a listener? Uh, I guess or like how do you, you experience personally? that as a viewer of the album <laughs> like times I mean if I look at the times on the album I'm like well someone did that intentionally because mm -hmm. that didn't happen randomly um if I were a listener I I don't know that you'd notice as a listener if you didn't see the track lengths mm -hmm. I don't know if you'd notice I mean you'd notice that there aren't really long tracks and there aren't really short tracks but you know human temporal perception is not that accurate at that speed right right so, uh, and there's a lot of things that change, affect our perception of length, right? Um, I mean, if, if the tracks are different tempo uh, from one another, um, sorry, different tempi, I never know whether to do the pretentious thing of making it tempi or, anyway, um, just an aside, uh, my, my, my mom is like part Italian and so she's always like, if you have one biscotti, it's a biscotto. And it's like, you know, well, actually, actually I do that because it's obnoxious, but um, okay, I, I, I distracted myself. Yeah, if the tracks have different tempi, we'll do the pretentious version, um, then you'll experience them as different lengths just because the different tempi will affect your temporal perception enough that you won't notice, I think. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, it's a weird question to ask, but um, this is, I mean, this is just the type of, esoteric thing no, I, I, i've heard i've heard uh i the I, I once heard from the composer jonathan berger he was talking about the schubert uh string quintet i'm i'm so like classical in all my examples uh this the schubert string quintet um you know the the length of the second movement of the quartet of the quintet is i think shorter maybe than the first movement but the, the question was like they did a study of like how long do people think all of these movements are um, compared with how long are these actual movements in, in, in clock time. And um, the second move, everyone thought it was really, really long and it wasn't. It's just very, it's just very kind of slow and um, uh, you, it feels almost stationary as it's moving along. And um, I think it was the second, it was the slow movement. I can't remember if that's the second movement, but it, it, but yeah, but the point is like people have actually studied this perceived length and actual length are, do not line up. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, so, so sorry to say that for your four minute <laughs> album or. Oh no, I mean, I'm, I'm just, just curious. Um, by the way, we're almost up in an hour. Do you have a little bit more time or should I rush through the rest yeah, of this? I, I have a little bit more time. I mean, I'd enjoy watching you rush through the questions, but no, just, <laughs> just, just go, go ahead. Well, um, first of all, I'm curious, have you been keeping up with the sort of like chess drama? The chess drama? Oh, the thing about Magnus Carlsen? Yeah, and uh, the guy potentially cheating, Hans Niemann. I mean, I wouldn't say I've been keeping up with it. I'm kind of vaguely aware of it. Are you a chess person? Not at all, but um, I, I've been listening to some podcasts <laughs> and like I have been sort of jealous of like these like, uh, you know, like ELO scores and basically like the quantified approach to like assessing everybody's capability in chess. And like, you know, we don't really have that in music because it's not a zero sum game. It's an art, but like. Um, it's not? <laughs> I'm just joking. Just go ahead, go ahead. Uh, but uh, I guess actually, like, honestly, very, very important perspective to have that is not a zero sum game. I have to remind myself of that. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's, it's really, really easy to compare yourself to other people and be like, oh, that person's at like a, that person's got a score of like 0.8 and I'm clearly at a 0.5 and it's like, you're doing different things. Like yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, well, I you're guess, jealous like, of the fact that they compare themselves that way. 
I, I mean, like the fact that even sports does this, it's like, you know, there's just like, like, I don't know, I guess it would be nice to like be able to quantify the performance difficulty of a piece and quantify the sort of performance capability of a performer and, you know, find matches. And I'm curious if that's anything that's ever run through your head or like how you would go about that or if you think that would be fruitful. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> so I feel like all my questions are notably more esoteric than you're used to. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I mean... It's no, the esoteric questions are really interesting. They're 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 fun questions, but um, but like performance ability is like n dimensional, and performance difficulty is n dimensional. So, it would be pretty hard to do that in a fruitful way. Okay. You know what I mean? It's a little bit like um, it's a little bit like ear training. I think is interesting. Um, like what is like what is ear training? Well, I mean, what you learn in in a in a class in music school of ear training um, is a very very narrow subset of what ear training is or what it could be, right? Mm -hmm. um, like, I, I've always been really bad at like, I, I don't consider myself very good at mixing, right? But there's a tremendous amount of ear training skill that goes into that, right? Mm -hmm. I, I never learned that in, you know, the undergrad ear training class, but it's very, very helpful to be able to tell when there's like a boost at 400 hertz or, or a cut at 400, you know, if you can tell when two mixes, like one of them has like a boost of three decibels at 400 hertz and one of them has, does not, that is a, that is an important ear training skill, right? Mm -hmm. So how many different ear training skills are there? Like <laughs> a lot. True. Yeah. How many different performance skills are there? A lot, right? Mm -hmm. How many different kinds of difficulty are there in, in peace? There's a lot of different kinds of difficulty. And some of them are hidden too. Um, uh, one of the things that comes up, I've, I've noticed with, with my music um, is when I've generated something using a random process, it is much harder to play mm -hmm. um, because performers are so used to locking into patterns. And so um, something that looks not that difficult, if there was a random process behind it and the patterns are constantly shifting a little bit, the performer is always like, oh, that's hard, that's hard, that's hard. Mm -hmm. And it's just like 10 times as much time it takes to learn it. Um, even though it looks like something that they could learn easily, um, the, the randomness inherent to the way that it was created makes it hard. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I think it's an interesting question, but I think the answer is that it would not work. <laughs> uh, I guess a sort of related question is like, um, and you know, I'm not good enough with coding or anything to actually throw this term out, but I'm going to, with the Kom Komogorov complexity, could you like have a complexity measure of a, a piece of music in sort of a compositional sense that like um, gives a sense of a composition's parsimony? If that makes sense, like, uh, like, I feel like I've seen people talk about, um, you know, like how many lines of code does it take to, you know, yield something, and like maybe mm. if having more elegant code that yields more, like, is there any sort of aesthetic implication there where, like, maybe that is in some ways better because it's like, you know, uh, more bang for buck. Uh, so are you are you are you kind of imagining like if you have a piece of music? and you were trying to encode that piece of music, what is the shortest encoding you could do of that piece of music? I mean, I'm not, so I don't actually, you know, I'm pretty self-taught when it comes to coding. I mean, I took some classes. I probably took more classes than I remember, but I don't know what Kolmogorov complexity is. So, um, so uh, I'm not qualified to use that term either. So I'm not a hundred percent sure. Is that, the, is that the O notation? Is that what that I, is? I don't think so. I mean, um... Uh, maybe I shouldn't have brought it up, but uh, I guess like I I've heard no, it explained okay. in terms of like a sort of like alternative. Yeah, thank you to for Occam. revealing my ignorance. No, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, I've heard it as like a sort of like oh you know so Occam's razor isn't formal like it's not super formalized. We can like instead describe it in terms of like you know how much code does it take to sum up this thing. So like if you had to like put like for instance I feel like uh, you know Bach you could like sum up with fewer lines of code than like. Stravinsky, not because it's better or worse, but there's a kind of inherent like uh, elegance to that being able to like be like, here's this 
compact piece of source code that's going to yield all these results versus kind of like here's this complicated human process that like you sort of have to like you know get messy with and like it it doesn't seem to be as compact I mean, I don't know if this is what you're talking about, but when you're when you're talking about summing up mock and source code, are you thinking of like, well, let's say that you were trying to like write some code to generate an invention that's already been written, right? So you're just trying to write code that produces that score or something like that. Mm. And um, while the invention, you know, has there, there's a lot of kind of internal repetition of motifs, so you can kind of compress it. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Stravinsky, maybe it wouldn't be as easy. Is that what you're saying? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I've been I've been thinking about this kind of thing sometimes, um, because uh, well, so so I made a video which was just kind of like here's a script that produces piano phase. I don't know if you saw that one, but um, but it was just basically you know you get the two loops going and you have one go at a slightly slower tempo than the other so that they drift and lock in at different times. Mm -hmm. And one of the people commented on the video and they were like. This is cool, but that wasn't really piano phase because piano phase is more complicated than that. You know, there's periods of pause where they don't shift at all. And they also switch to different motives at certain times. And, um, and they were like, you know, I tried to code piano phase once and it actually got kind of difficult and kind of confusing. And so then I was thinking, I, I may do a follow up to that video in which I try to do the true score of piano phase. And I think it would be kind of an interesting proposition because you have to figure out how to encode these aspects of the macro structure, right? Um, how do you encode the fact that it's gonna be kind of drifting and then it's pausing and then it's drifting and then it's pausing and then it's drifting and then it's pausing. And then here you shift to this and to this, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think the process of trying to boil that down to code reveals something about the, the piece itself and the complexity of the piece itself. Um, and I think there are, I think that the truth is that a lot of intuitively rhythm, uh, to intuitively rhythm music would be very difficult to boil down to code in this way. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think Bach included. I mean, I, I, I mean Bach. Maybe if you've got this repetition of motives, it's, it's a little bit easier sometimes. But I mean, uh, there's so much in, in kind of intuitive working together in Bach. I don't think it's. I don't think it's so easy. Mm -hmm. um, no idea if I answered your question. No idea if I even understood your question, but I talked about it. That's fair. Um, <laughs> you know, next time I'll uh, I'll you know tighten the question up the so it makes sense. Um, no, so, no, it's not. It's not your fault, possibly. <laughs> um, I guess I'm I'm curious. Um, it seems like you know an aesthetic tendency in contemporary composition or just like modern composition is for it to get more and more complex. And I'm curious if you think this will top out and if there's a better sort of uh, thing to aim for than complexity, because like it shouldn't just all be about how difficult and complicated and complex a piece is, right? Like there can be a, a different sort of version of progress, right? I mean, has it not already topped out, do you think? I mean, I, I feel like there's a tendency now towards, towards simplicity and, you know, ease of listening. There's a lot of trends, right? There's all mm -hmm. sorts of trends. Um, uh, one of the trends is towards increasing complexity, but one of the trends is towards um, writing music that people want to listen to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, to me, I mean, I guess to me, it's all good, right? Uh, I, uh, you know, in terms of this kind of like, this rating scale from from zero to one right of like good bad to good and that being just ridiculous when it comes to music mm -hmm. i mean it, it's all about making something that's meaningful to you and then that hopefully is meaningful to other people there's i don't think it i think there's probably as many answers to the to the kind of question of what the ultimate goal of music or of composition is as mm -hmm. there are composers and listeners you know and I, I think that's i think that's that's totally okay um i well hmm. how can i put this okay so maybe this is maybe this is an answer to your question i have no idea um when, when i was younger um 
I told you, I grew up as like a, you know, classical pianist and composer. When mm -hmm. I was younger, I did not like pop music at all. Um, because I was like, well, it's just so uninventive harmonically. Like, it's just always just like these, like, where's the interest in that, you know? Um, and uh, as I've gotten older, I've realized how, um, how silly that way of judging the music is because there's so many different kind of parameters that music operates under, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're listening for harmonic variety in, um, in like, I don't know, a doo-wop record or something like that, you're not gonna find it. But if you listen for, um, for other things like vocal timbre or something like that, you might find it, right? Um, so so um, I don't know, I, I mean, I'm, I think my, my experience as I've grown older is just of like appreciating more and more different varieties of music that I was close to previously. Um, and so, but you asked about complexity. So what the heck am I talking about? Um, and your question at all? Well, uh, if we like think about like Brian Fernie Howe and yeah, you know, it's getting to the point where it's like, I don't even know that his music is as complex as it looks. Like, I feel like you listen to it and you're like, oh, but you look at it and you're like, you know, you have a panic attack, but like compared to like John Adams or like Steve Reich or something like, um, I, I feel like there's something that's a lot more like parsimonious and like elegant about like, oh yeah, I just have a piano playing the same thing over and over. And then like this natural sonic phenomena emerges and you're like, whoa, cool. It's like, sounds sparkly and out of phase and like, you know, but then like, I feel like in terms of bang for buck, you don't actually get that with Brian Fernie, huh? Um, I don't know, actually, you know, it's, it's interesting. You get, um, th this is, maybe this is sort of what I was trying to talk about. Like different music has different kinds of goals and appeals to different kinds of people. Um, I think, so I went to Stanford as an undergrad and Brian Fernie Hill was there. Mm -hmm. And um, I, at the time I was like, what the heck is this? Mm -hmm. Like, why does this need to be so complicated? Like, wh what, I mean, what do you get out of listening to this? I don't get it. And as I've gotten older, I've gotten it more and more. And I've seen a couple of live performances of, of Fernie Howe, And I was like, whoa, this is actually really engaging. And Part of the reason that it's engaging is because in order to play it, the performers have had to work on it for so long. And that's kind of part of the point of the music mm -hmm. is this kind of, is almost got this kind of like um, ethos of anti-efficiency, like kind of anti-capitalist, anti-efficient uh, kind of ethos to it of like, we're gonna write this piece, which is absurdly complicated and the performer is going to have to work on it. The performer is going to be a top-notch performer who's going to have to dedicate two years of their life to learning this piece. And that's the point of it. And when you hear it, you hear all of that energy and effort and this kind of engagement with something that's nearly impossible and trying to make it happen. And um, it comes across in the energy of the, to me, especially in a live performance, it comes across in the energy of the piece. And um, increasingly, I've really appreciated Fernie Howe. I don't know that other people need to do it. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not... I'm not sure it's like, do we need to go further in that direction? Probably not. Um, but it's a, it's a kind of a unique form of expression that really appeals to certain performers. And when you have um, the composer who's serious about it and the performer who's really engaged with it and an audience that's open to it, it can be a really great experience, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it's one of many really great musical experiences you can have, you know? And I don't think that one experience is better than the other, you know? Right. Um, I don't, it's not, it's, I don't see kind of the history of music as a progression towards complexity. And then we've hit peak complexity and it's going down. It's like individual people interact with what they have before them and they make their own things and I'm rambling again. So anyway, I'm gonna stop rambling. Um, well, I'm, I guess I'm curious um, if you have any takes on like the AI stuff that's been coming around like Dolly or Stable Diffusion and sort of like when that will hit music and, um, you know, I mean, I feel like certain people are worried about it. I don't know that we need to worry about that type of thing, but um, do you have any thoughts on like machine learning sort of coming into music? Yeah. Um... 
I think that I think it's really interesting. We talked a little bit earlier about this kind of negotiation of like the micro form and the meso form and the macro form and moving between them and kind of juggling what's interesting on different levels. That kind of like intuitive negotiation, I think is very far off for any kind of AI process. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, you know, so, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to act like I'm super versed in it, but what I do think is interesting about um, AI is it's a little bit fickle in its intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember uh, hearing about uh, an example where someone had trained an AI to um, play Super Mario, right? Mm -hmm. And it could just like play, I think, I mean, I'm just remembering this, I'm probably getting it all wrong, but let's say, let's say it was Super Mario. And, um, and it could play it like extraordinarily well, right? Um, but if you made some tweaks to the game, like, I don't know, the boxes are slightly bigger um, or the gravity is slightly different, it just completely failed. Mm -hmm. It just completely fell apart. Um, whereas a human player is, more, is somehow more adaptive than that, you know? Mm -hmm. The human player might, might take a really long time to master it, but then they run into this somewhat different version of it and they can adapt, right? Um, there's a certain um, kind of flexibility that humans have when they interact with things that I don't think AI has, and I don't think that it will for a long time, but I'm not an AI researcher. Mm -hmm. I have, I am not qualified to talk about this, um, but I, 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 I think that there's, uh, there's something about the kind of negotiation of attention and consciousness that is very hard to reproduce using an AI system. Mm -hmm. you know? um, it also seems like well, I, with the no, Mario, um, I mean, with the Mario thing, it seems like one of the successes is also that it seems to exploit like minor bugs, right? Like, you know, once it learns how to do some sort of thing, like go off the ledge just a little bit and there's a, you know, a bug in the game that allows you to then, you know, whatever, like, um, like it seems like there are a bunch of little exploits of like um, some sort of, you know, inconsistency in the game where a human would never be able to like, just learn that and be like, I'm going to take advantage of this in this crazy way. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if that's like the same sort of uh, Mario thing that you were talking about. Maybe, yeah, I, I think it might be the same thing. Um, yeah. Um, what you said made me think of something, but I forgot what it was. Um, so that's fun for your listeners. Um, yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think that ultimately, like, I, you know, I hope what happens with like AI tools is that they become just another tool um, that that human beings can use to make things that are interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I mean, I don't think that, I, I, unfortunately, I think it's pretty hard to have the degree of expertise that you need to understand AI systems deeply. And it's pretty darn hard to have the degree of expertise you need to really understand music at a deep level and be creative with it. Mm -hmm. And the overlap between people who have both is very, very narrow. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's hard because I think you have a lot of people who know how to work with AI, but don't know how to apply it to music. Right. And a lot of people who have musical abilities, but don't, can't, can't like work with, can't figure out how to work with the AI stuff. And personally, I just haven't done anything with this. I think part of the reason is because Somehow I think I find like the simple explicit systems just interesting enough already. Mm -hmm. Like, so, so like your example of the, um, the, you know, figuring out the lengths of the piece of, of the sections of the piece of music using random numbers. That is very simple. You don't even need a computer to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but it's actual implications in terms of your process of working and the art that you create is quite significant. Right. So you don't need a complicated system to create a complicated dynamic within the people creating the art, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think for that reason, I've often tended to kind of uh, 
just favor simple explicit systems because I still find them very interesting and I don't need to add some sort of like complicated AI component to it. Totally. Yet. Um, although I think I want to explore at some point because it's very trendy and I feel like I need to know what I'm talking about. Of course, yeah. I mean, the stuff that it's doing with, you know, images is pretty impressive. But um, then again, like, you know, people are eventually saying, oh, yeah, it's actually the human prompt that seems to be interesting. Like, just because it renders the human right. prompt, like, it's still the prompt that's interesting. Yeah, it's the prompt that's interesting. And it's also the data set that it's learning from, which is... I mean, what, what data set did it learn from other than like the giant corpus of human created stuff? Right. You know, and so, so what I think becomes interesting is like the questions of what do you train on? And, you know, yeah, and what prompts do you use? And how do you, how do you structure the neural network? All of these things are kind of decisions that human beings have to make somewhere in the process. And so then you get, okay, so that it, maybe you get something really interesting out of it. Did the AI create that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or did did the all the large collaboration of people who came up with the right architecture and the millions of people who generated the images that it was scraping to come up with it did mm -hmm. they come up with it you know what i mean i i yeah i think um i mean i i, I my personal opinion is we're pretty long way off from like a ai artist that's really a threat to human beings but you know <laughs> as i said i'm not an expert right well, um, I guess like uh, with some of the remaining time, we should probably talk a little bit more about Scamp. And um, I'm curious, so is that like the tool that you use for all your all of your composition or um, do you do other processes or, um, yeah? I mean, at this point, I mostly use Scamp, but um, the whole point of Scamp is that it's not supposed to be a one-stop shop, mm. right? So the whole point of how I built it was to, to connect it to other tools, right? So, um, you know, if you want to create some music in Scamp, you can create a part using sound fonts or something, and it'll play some notes back using a synthesized piano. But if, if you want, you can just, instead of saying new part, you can say new MIDI part, and it sends those MIDI messages wherever you want it to send them. Or you can say new OSC part, and it sends OSC messages wherever you want it to send it. And then at the end, you know, you can, if you want, you can kind of transcribe, it's called, you can say start transcribing, and then it starts kind of keeping track of all the notes that you play, and you can stop transcribing, and you've got this performance, which you can save to a MIDI file, um, or you can convert to a score, which is where all of that goes questions of like, how do I encode this notation coming to play, you can export it as music, music XML, or as lily pond, and the whole point of this is um, you can use it as much or as little as you want, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, you know, I have done things where I've, you know, used Scamp to send MIDI messages to a modular synthesizer, right? That I think is really, really fun, right? Mm -hmm. Because it allows you to combine the kind of, Scamp is more of a, it's very, it's, it's note based, but in a very broad sense. So I, I almost want to say it's like sound object based rather than note based. Mm -hmm. Um, because you can use Scamp to control any arbitrary synthesis parameters that you want. But um, but it, it has that kind of note-based element to it. And so if you send it to a, a modular synthesizer, then, then you can work in this kind of more continuous timbral space in reaction to the note-based stuff. Um, I mean, the truth is, I think often what I end up doing is I'll create something in Scamp that then generates some music notation, and then I'll work with that music notation intuitively. Gotcha. Um, I would say that um, I, I do find it interesting. I mean, sometimes I'll work with, you know, I'll, I'll like use MuseScore or whatever. I switched to MuseScore at some point because Avid took over Sibelius and I couldn't stand it anymore. Um, but, you know, I'll, I, sometimes I'll do something in MuseScore and I'll start kind of copying and pasting in MuseScore. But then sometimes I'll realize that the kind of interface of MuseScore is really problematic for me. Uh, and that is pushing me in directions I don't want to go. And then I start writing stuff by hand on a piece of paper. And to be honest, one of the ways that I really think is very valuable, um, I did actually, I, I, I wrote a paper which is going to come out at some point, but it's all, it's all about the kind of uh, feedback loop of the compositional process. And I interviewed a bunch of different composers. A lot of those composers said they like to work on pencil and paper. Mm -hmm. And um, Ever since I did those interviews, I've started sometimes sketching on pieces of paper. And um, it, it's, 
so valuable. It create it, there's a there's a kind of fluidity to that, you know, um, that you, you that you don't experience when you work within a notation program on a computer, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so um, so I guess in answer to your question, it, it, in terms of like algorithmic processes, I mostly use Scamp because this is a tool that I created, you know, first and foremost for my own compositional process. So it's clearly very tailored to my form of expression. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, but I don't just use, but I tend to use Scamp in addition to other programs like MuseScore. Or sometimes I'll use Super Collider because I have some experience in Super Collider. And often I'll do things just on paper um, or at the piano because I'm a pianist. So I, I like to kind of work at the piano too. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Um, yeah. Does so that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I'd be curious to know how your sort of intuitive lens has been affected by developing Scamp. Because I mean, I'm sure that it's sort of like modulated the way that you are intuitive with your compositions, um, just having to be so explicit for so long in developing it. Oh, that's an interesting question. I don't know if I have an interesting answer to it, but it's an interesting <laughs> question. Um, having worked with, you, you mean like if I approach music intuitively, if I'm like sitting at the piano and kind of writing something intuitively, has Scamp kind of changed the way that I do that? I guess so, yeah. I don't have a good answer to that question, <laughs> probably. <laughs> Probably it has. Um, but I don't know the answer. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, um, so we've talked about Scamp. Um, so I guess I, I need to, you know, sign up for this Cadence class of yours um, because I feel like, you know, uh, I've been trying to learn Python for a while, <laughs> not particularly actively, but um, I've had the yeah. desire. And so I, I'm thinking that your Cadenz class is probably the way to uh, trick myself into, you know, learning everything and retaining it by making it about music. Oh, yeah, you totally should. Um, apparently it's pronounced Cadenze. Oh, Cadenze. No one, who, who, who would have known? It's pretty hard <laughs> to figure out, but K-A-D-E-N-Z-E. But yeah, I put together this class with Cadenze, uh, which is just called Computer Assisted Music in Python, which kind of it's kind of an, a, a beginner introduction to writing Python code and using Scamp to make music. And it's kind of, it's kind of aimed at people who um, may have no experience with programming. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you, you know, it introduces some sort of basic concepts and you learn programming through, through making music with it. And I'm kind of passionate about this. I think it's kind of interesting because, uh, because I'm interested in this relationship between programming structures and music structures, right? So like, what is a for loop? Well, it turns out that a for loop can often kind of create a sequence. It's very easy for a for loop to create a musical sequence, Mm. Um, you know? And uh, like, what is a function? Well, I tend to think of functions sometimes as musical gestures, right? Because they're kind of, I mean, a function in code is a kind of repeated thing that you can run multiple times. Well, in, 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 in a piece of music, a gesture is a kind of, repeated thing that you can come back to multiple times. A function can take parameters, right? Um, which kind of make it behave in somewhat different ways. And gestures can have different versions of themselves, right? So like functions with parameters can map to different versions of musical gestures. All of this stuff, that, that's kind of the lens that this course takes is like, let's explore programming concepts through their musical implications. And, um, and yeah, you should take it. Mm-hmm. And so should your <laughs> listeners, I should be promoting it. <laughs> it's no, it's it's really it's really it's really great. Um, I I feel really good about what I put together there, and um, and it's a good it's a good place to start. And I also teach workshops sometimes, right? So, um, I teach a, a summer workshop at at Karma at Stanford each summer, um, and I usually teach a kind of independent one sometime in January. So, um, you should take that too. I mean, I'd <laughs> love to have you. You seem like an interesting. Uh, you bring an interesting perspective to it. So yeah. Um, it will definitely let me know when any of that is happening. Um, I, I guess, uh, so since you've been through, you know, uh, grad school for composition, right? Or it's specifically composition mm-hmm. or new media or something. Um, I did a, it's kind of both. I mean, I did, I've done a couple masters in, I did a master's in, at Stanford in music science and technology and at UCSB in media arts and technology, but I also got a PhD in composition from UCSB. So it's gotcha. kind of, it's kind of both. I'm at the PhD level of a composer, but I'm at the master's level of a <laughs> media artist. So 
you know, take that as you will. Well, so you definitely have some grad school under your belt. Um, for somebody who's like looking into grad school um, currently, do you have any wisdom or sort of uh, suggestions? Or do you think that there's any like, you know, uh, particularly, you know, rich path to take in that world? I mean, I, I guess my main suggestion is uh, I'm a big fan of finding kind of mentors who um, who you work on, work with one on one who you find really exciting. Well, there's two things. OK, there's the mentor, uh, kind of the, the teachers who are going to have like perspectives that really open you up. Um, I found at UCSB, I had a, a, a good set of mentors in uh, Joel Feigen, who was a kind of a, knew nothing about computers and was um, a, a, just, you know, he's a kind of intuitive old school composer who was very perceptive, even though he knew nothing about computers, he could be very perceptive um, because he wasn't enamored with technology. So if mm -hmm. he did something with technology that was like technically cool, but musically uninteresting, he'd just be like, that's not that interesting. Um, so he was really helpful. Um, uh, Curtis, uh, sorry, Curtis Rhodes was, is uh, obviously just a world-class teacher in, in terms of, uh, in terms of, um, you know, electroacoustic music and then, uh, Clarence Barlow, uh, it was this crazy algorithmic composer that I, I learned a lot from. And that, that combination of different mentors that had kind of balanced abilities that all resonated with me, that was really good for me in grad school and really opened me up musically. Um, but the other thing is uh, uh, the cohort, you know, it's so important to, to find the cohort of, um, of uh, other composers who, who kind of bring out interesting sides to you. I mean, so if you're looking into grad school, uh, I mean, definitely, well, I mean, you're kind of already doing a good job because you're interviewing a whole bunch of people, right? <laughs> so you're, you're, you're forming these kind of personal relationships with different people at different schools. So I, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a great approach, right? Because mm -hmm. you can start to feel like, oh, I have, this, I have good resonance with this person. And so this is a place I should apply to. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's great. The other thing that I think is great about what you're doing is you've taken like 10 years off. Um, that's, that's really good because, uh, yeah, I mean, what is grad school for? Mm -hmm. uh, it's good to have some sort of sense really of what you're trying to get out of it before you enter into it. Totally. Um, I don't know if any of that's helpful at all. No, it totally is. Um, in terms of sort of like finding mentors that you resonate with, I mean, like besides inviting people to do interviews on the podcast and stuff, I mean, like, should I just be bugging people via email? Um, you know, or like how, how do you find, because I guess, I mean, like, yeah, mostly, I, mostly Snapchat. I'm just, I'm just joking. I don't know. Sure. Go ahead. What were you guys um, saying? So, I mean, like, you know, if you're like, okay, I'm going to school, I look at a school, who's their faculty? Like, that seems like a sort of indirect way of finding a mentor. Cause, like, you know, what's the likelihood that any random school is going to have a mentor that resonates with you? Like, it seems like maybe you should find the institution through the mentor. Um, I mean, is there any good way to like hunt down people that uh, you could work with? Uh... <laughs> I, I don't know. It's been a long time since I was in that position. And I, I, I mean, I think I, I came to UCSB because I found out about Clarence Barlow and then I went and I met with him and I realized that I could learn a lot from him. But how did I come across him? I, I don't know. I feel like I probably came across him through like some YouTube video of his music or something like that. I, how does anyone find anyone these days? Right. I, 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 I don't know. Um, but I kind of agree. I mean, I would tend to say mentor first, institution second, but, but it also depends on what you're trying to get out of grad school, mm -hmm. right? Um, are you, I mean, I remember uh, someone once was advising me as I was thinking about going into grad school, like, is what you're interested in, are you interested in having like a bunch of years to dedicate to your craft um, in which you're kind of supported financially? That, that leads to one kind of grad school. Are you interested in having... Um, a kind of a certain kinds of like mentor teachers that leads to maybe a somewhat different decision. Um, are you interested in, um, you know, being prepared to like teach at a university or something like that? Maybe that leads to a different decision. Like what you're trying to get out of it, it, it affects whether or not you should be searching for like mentor relationships 
or searching for just a place that will give you funding, mm -hmm. you know, the, I mean, so the, these are kinds of important, important questions that you should ask yourself as you're applying, you know, because I, I, of course, I tend to sort of say, okay, it's really, it's all about this kind of relationship with the teachers and stuff, but, you know, for some people, all that matters is that they have five years of funding to mm -hmm. just work on what they're trying to work on. And I think that's a totally legit approach to grad school too, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, those all sound like worthwhile approaches. And the question and I'm not sure. I think part of the, part of the message of this teacher was that you can't get all of them usually. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> so you should think about what your priorities are. That's very good advice. Um, Cool. Well, I guess um, I've taken up 90 minutes of your time so we can uh, wrap up here um, and just reiterate SCAMP is your, um, you know, Python library for composition. Very cool. Yeah. You have tons of YouTube videos explaining how to use it and it's all, you know, super impressive to see what you're able to do just, you know, by typing in some simple Thank code you. and then um, your Cadenze class on Python and music um, available on Cadenze. Yeah, computer assisted music in Python on cadenze.com, which is spelled K-A-D-E-N-Z-E. -E. Uh, you can probably put a link in the description or something like that, right? I will do that. Okay. Um, so, anything so else you want to promote or you know, uh, you know point people to towards? Promote? Hmm. Such a grand opportunity. No, I can't <laughs> think of anything. <laughs> thanks, Ooh. though. This has been a this has been a fun conversation. Yeah, thanks so much for talking to me. Um, yeah. Thanks I've enjoyed, me. by the way, I've listening to some of your other interviews. Uh, it's an interesting podcast. You've got you've got a lot of interesting guests, and I think it's it's really cool what you're doing. Awesome. Thanks so much for listening, dude. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, Mark Evanstein, it's been a pleasure. I'll talk to you in the future. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Adios. Adios.